thanks for checking out Chemistry Connections on the Hopewell Valley Student Podcasting Network, a proud partner of HVSPN.com, where students come together to publish content to share with the world. The opinions represented within this episode are those of the content creators only. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to Chemistry Connections. My name is Alex Prof, and I'm your host for episode number six. And today we're going to be discussing the chemistry of snake venoms. There are two main categories of venomous snakes. The first is going to be elapids, and the second is vipers. Elapids are any of 300 species uh, or so of venomous snakes, all of which are venomous, with short fixed fangs that are at the front of the mouth. They typically have long, slender bodies with small, round heads, and for the most part, lay eggs. Their bite is typically painless, but often results in paralysis, which can be very dangerous if it affects the heart or lungs. Um, Common examples of these include uh, cobras, taipans, crates, sea snakes, And then on the other hand, you have vipers, which are about 200 different species, a little bit smaller than elapids, with long, hollow fangs that fold back to the roof of the mouth until they strike. Some species, known as pit vipers, have a temperature-sensing organ that lets them hunt warm-blooded prey, warm-blooded prey, even when they can't see. Um, and their large venom glands actually lead them to have a uh, sort of triangular-shaped head. Uh, it's a very distinctive head shape that a lot of people think of when they think of, of snakes. It's seen in like rattlesnakes, uh, uh, any sort of like pit viper, eyelash viper, that type of thing. Um, and it's actually led some elapids or non-venomous snakes as well to flatten their heads before they strike as a sort of threat display because it makes them look like they're a venomous, uh, venomous snake. <clears throat> So beyond just the physical characteristics, vipers and elapids have very different mechanisms action for the most part. Most part. Vipers typically have a hemolytic or cytotoxic venom, which causes direct tissue damage um, and can lead to necrosis, which is um, tissue death and cell death. It's very nasty, gross. Um, and then elapids are typically neurotoxic, which means They can cause paralysis and damage to the nervous system, often leaving the body mostly unharmed. Um, A good example of viper venom is going to be the saw-scaled viper, which is uh, in the the Middle East and India. And when it bites, it affects the circulation of your blood, which causes you to uh, have internal hemorrhaging and organ damage. Because what happens is... uh, certain uh, clotting factors, the venom binds to those, causing them to form thousands of very, very small blood clots that then prevent actual meaningful blood clots from forming because there's not enough leftover clotting factor to stop any sort of bleeding that happens. Other proteins also then cause cell damage, especially within the bloodstream, causing you to bleed internally and have no way of fixing that, which then proceeds to cause shock in someone bitten. Uh, And it can be reversed with an antivenom, um, because what it does is it denatures the proteins in the venom, preventing them from causing damage. On the other hand, you then have a lapid, such as the inland taipan, which, though it hasn't killed anyone ever, Uh, that we know of, it is the most venomous snake that we are aware of. Um, It has both presynaptic and postsynaptic methods of uh, uh, methods of causing neurotoxic damage. The uh, presynaptic is going to be something called paradoxin, which binds to the interior of the nerve membrane and prevents the release of acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter responsible for allowing your muscles to contract. Um, It also depolarizes the neuron, preventing the firing of an action potential, 
which is the electric signal that is in the nerve cell. Uh, it be it's believed to fuse the little containers of acetylcholine to the presynaptic membrane and prevent the recycling of already used um, capsules uh, by affecting the permeability of the, the cell membrane. Because what happens, or what is believed to happen, is that when it binds, it changes the structure because of the, uh, the attractive portion of the membrane, or the membrane end of the protein toxin. And then so postsynaptic neurotoxins present include oxylepitoxin 1, alpha-oxytoxin 1, and alpha-scutoxin 1 which what happens is they bind to the acetylcholine receptors in, muscle, in muscles antagonistically, which means that they bind without activating, then preventing acetylcholine from binding. So not only does it prevent acetylcholine from being released, it prevents it from being uptaken. <clears throat> and the way it does this is just by being so much more uh, having such a greater affinity to the receptor than acetylcholine because it mimics the structure of acetylcholine but with even more attractive features on its surface. When someone is envenomated by a snake such as the inland taipan, there's no way to reverse the venom, um, but what can happen is they can be put on a mechanical ventilator, um, like the ones used for people with severe COVID, because what that does is it forces you to keep breathing, even if the muscles that control your lungs have been completely paralyzed. Um, another thing that can be administered is something called Carbacol, which is a chemical that, similarly to acetylcholine, uh, activates, uh, activates the receptors, but it has a greater affinity than the venom, and it activates the receptors. So it can lead to seizures in some cases, but it does reverse the effects of the venom. <clears throat> now, this is a topic that has kind of always been a little interested, uh, interesting to me, and I've never really had the opportunity to dive super deep into it. Um, but I really kind of just decided to pull the trigger with this project, and I found it really fascinating, and I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to really research.